Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 2 of the series, Start Developing Swift UI Apps. I'm Lucas from the Mobile Development Club at the University of Washington. In the last episode, we covered how to make a simple user interface as well as getting familiarized with Xcode itself. In this episode, we will be doing an introduction to interaction and data flow. Our main objectives for today is to understand how data flows in SwiftUI and how to manage them, implementing buttons in both their appearance and behaviors, using the SF symbol package for quick and consistent icons, and packing a group of UI elements into their own view and connecting it to another view. So let's start off with understanding how data flows to SwiftUI. So in SwiftUI, any variable that can be changed while the app is running is given a property wrapper called state. And we will do a more in-depth coverage of how property wrappers work, but for now you just need to understand that at state means that it is a variable that will potentially be changed during the runtime of the application. So right here we have a state variable situation, and right now its default value is pretty good. Now there's a couple of things we can do with this variable right here. The first thing is access it like any other variables. We can print it, we can access it using a label, or we can change it by simply assigning another value of it. So I can print pretty good, or I can change pretty good into not that good. Now SwiftUI has a second thing, a second property wrapper that's tied to state, and that is binding. Think of binding as a mirror image of the state variable. They are used by putting a dollar sign in front of the name of the variable, and that gives you the binding. In another view, a binding can be used by specifying another variable of another name that binds to the variable of its parent view. Now this is sort of hard to explain on the screen here, so I'm going to demonstrate exactly what I mean by that, because binding is not very straightforward if I just put it on a screen, so we're, just, we're going to head to Xcode very quick. Okay, so I'm right here in Xcode where we left off last time. Now, if we look at what we have to do, we have to declare first a state variable. And in this situation, we're going to declare the name of the meal that we're going to be inputting. So, what I'm going to do is inside the view, the structure of the view, but outside the body of the view, because the variable itself isn't a UI element that goes in the body. I'm going to put it right here in between. I'm just going to do state. I'm going to put it right here in between, and I'm going to do state. State variable uh, meal, meal name. And then we're, it's going to be a string and we can give it a default value of an empty string. Okay, so now we have now we have a variable that holds the meal name. Now something for the first example of accessing the variable, I can access it and I can change it. So let's just for testing purposes, let's just access it um, with a label, with a text label here. So I just go ahead and put, it's going to autocomplete, meal name right here. And now I have a label that displays the meal name. Now on second thought, let's make the default value untitled meal. And then what we want to do with this button is that when we tap it, that meal name changes back to untitled meal. So in here, in the action closure, what we're going to do is simply we're going to put in well this this is called meal name so meal name equals 
just like that. So, ooh, we have a error right here. It turns out that when basically when what you're trying to reference is in a closure and as an argument to another function, you need to insert self in front of it. Now, this generally isn't something you have to worry about because Xcode is going to fix it for you just like that. So, so far we've done two things with this value variable. We've accessed it with this label right here, and we modified it using a button. But what about what about it's, what about I want to name? I want to name my meal something. Well, that's what we did last time. We made a whole text field for it. Now you see here, this logarithm label called text is expecting a value. So it's meal name, right? I'm just gonna go ahead and put put meal name right there. Put meal name right there, and it gives me an error. Let's see what it is. So it appears that a text field only accepts bindings. And once again, Xcode will take care of this for you, but let's just go ahead and take a look. If I go ahead and do meal name again, and you see that it gives me a binding right here. It's the same thing. Now, in order to illustrate how a binding really works, I believe this is the best way to illustrate how a binding really works. Let's just go ahead and build it now that we have everything completed. So if you recall, what we did essentially was that text field is that we're in the same view. So in this case, we just simply use the binding with the dollar sign in front of it. And we're just going to wait for it to build. Okay, so now our preview has appeared and we have the meal name label. We have the text field with the default meal name, which is untitled meal. And we have the button here. And we have a text here that I simply, it simply access what the value of meal name is. So we're gonna be a bit more clear on what that is. I'm going to go ahead and run it. Okay, so the app is now up and running. And let's just go ahead and see what happens when we make changes to the text field. As you can see, the value of meal name changes with whatever is in the text field. And this is essentially what a binding does. It is a mirror, it is a mirror image of the variable. Because if I tie to it as a binding, it's gonna it's going to change it immediately. Think of it as it automatically updates it whenever you change the value. So let's see. And if I go ahead and click set default label text, I get untitled meal back. Okay, so everything is behaving as we would expect them to. For a more detailed explanation of the entire concept of data flowing Swift UI, please see the WWDC 2019 video, Data Flows to Swift UI. All links will be in the description. And the second thing we're going to do is implementing buttons. In button, it takes in a closure of code as its action, as an argument. And it has appearance code in a closure that follows it. Actions code is just some regular code. But remember that error we got back in Xcode, saying that we need to put self in it. And that is one thing to remember about buttons. The action closure need to have self in it for all variables, but the appearance one does not necessarily need to. And the appearance code simply consists of standard UI elements, for example, a text or image. At WWDC 2019, a library of icons called SF symbols was introduced. 
It is embedded in iOS 13 and later, watchOS 6 and later, as well as tvOS 13 and later. There is a macOS app for viewing all the symbols, which you can download from the human interface guideline. This app is pretty useful in searching the symbols and getting their names. So here I am in the SF Symbols app. And as we can see, there are plenty of standardized symbols that we can use. So the next thing we're going to do is to implement a star rating system as seen right here. So let's go ahead and get to that. Now, in order to implement the stars, because it is very likely that we are going to be using the stars somewhere else, we're going to be putting them inside its own view structure so that we can use them, reuse them without reusing the same code. Here is a general structure of a view, and let's go ahead and put those five stars in a view. So here I am back in Xcode, and the first thing I'm going to do is simply create a new file. Create a new file. Let's go ahead and do Swift UI view, and I'm going to call it supporting views. Now this is where we're going to be putting all these smaller views that might get reused so that we don't use the same code again all throughout the project. So we're going to create that. And as you can see, Xcode is quite nice to have already constructed this entire thing as well as the preview for us. Now in the same Swift file, there can be multiple structures and you can preview them by calling them here. So for this one, we're just going to change this to rating stars. And obviously it doesn't have that, so we're going to change this to waiting stars. Okay. Now we know that the view waiting stars is going to be receiving a binding to some other variables from its parent view. Because one of the key aspects of the state, state and binding system is that this state variable here is the only source of truth, which means that everything that modifies it leads directly back to it. So even if I'm using this in a completely different view by using a binding, I can make sure that this is the one and only variable that I am actually modifying. This makes it safe in the sense that there are no multiple variables to take care of and everything is synchronized. So back here in the main view, we're going to be adding another state variable called rating that is going to be an integer and the default rating is going to be zero. So we have done that. In supporting view, we're going to be doing a very, very similar thing. Actually, we have this hello world, so I'm just going to say hi right here because you have to have at least one UI element in the body, otherwise it's going to throw an error. We're going to be creating a binding variable. Um, now you can call it rating, but you can actually call this whatever you want. Um, I'm just going to call it rating four stars. It's going to be an integer. And right here, we don't actually have to specify its default value because it's a binding to the other value. Now, the first thing is in the preview section, it throws an error because it is now expecting a binding, but it is not receiving one. To counter this issue, we are going to give it a binding. However, because it is a preview, we cannot just pull the state variable from its parent view and then put it in. And this is why a special syntax comes in. So I'm putting waiting for stars. And the special thing is dot constant. See, so it says, creates a binding with an immutable value. So let's just give it a rating of 
four stars. So what this will do is it's going to treat it, it's going to preview the view as if the binding for rating four stars is four. Okay, so there are a couple things that we can realize right away. The first is that we will need five buttons because we have five stars. Now to create a button, we just do this action, closure here, and then another closure like this. And we're also going to do this. Now here is the tiny bit complicated part about this button because it can potentially have two states. It can be empty or it can be full. Luckily, SF symbol gives us a very nice way to do that. I'm just going to search stars real quick. And what do you know? We have a unfilled star and a filled star. What we do know is we have five buttons, five buttons. So we have five buttons here. Now its appearance, let's just ignore all of these errors for one second here. This is the first button. So if the value for rating is between, between one and five, it is going to be filled. So to accomplish this behavior of the buttons, we're going to be using ternary operators. So basically what ternary operators are is you have a statement followed by a question mark, A and B. What this means is that if statement is true, return A. Otherwise, if statement is false, return B. So what we know for sure for the very first button is that if the value for rating for stars is between 1 and 5, it has to be light up because the only time when it's not light up is when the rating is 0. So to get a SF symbol displayed in the view, we need an image. So we have right here, image, and one of his arguments is system name. Right here. So what we essentially want to do here is just go ahead and make the tenary operator. So the statement is if the range one and five contains rating for stars, if it contains it, we're going to be returning a filled star. So if I could recall correctly, is star dot fill star. Dot fail. Or if it's not, we're just going to return a plain star. Yep, it's called a plain star right here. And in terms of buttons, the way we want to implement this behavior is when we tap on any of the five stars, we give it a rating. We tap on another star, we give it another rating. That is that star. And if we want to return back to zero stars at any time, we tap the value it is currently on again. For example, we are at four stars rating right now. So if I tap on the four star again, it's going to be, can be back to zero stars. But if I tap on any of the other stars, I will get that rating. So let's think about how we can represent this. So this is the first star. Let's, let's see. Okay. So, well, the first thing we got to do is we need to do self dot rating, oh, rating for stars equals. So, first we need to check whether, whether ratings for, whether it's self, don't forget the self dot ratings for stars is equal to one. If it is equal to one, then we're going to return zero. If it's not equal to one, however, we're going to return one. So we're not done with the implementation of a single button. 
Now all the other buttons should be fairly straightforward because the second button it should be if it's between two and five, it's gonna light up. And it should be that we should be checking if it's equal to two. If yes, return back to zero. If not, we set it to two. So I'm just going to be very quickly filling them up with I'm going to be very quickly filling them up with the respective values. This one's going to be string. And for the last one here, if it's between five and five, what we're just going to do is if ratings for stars is equals to five. Okay. And here we still have some errors, so let's do some quick troubleshooting. What could it be? Ah, okay. So it appears that I have forgotten to put my buttons inside a stack. Now, if you recall, Apollo went roughly through what stacks are in the very first episode, but he also made a follow-up videos on what stacks are. So I highly suggest you check that out because stacks can be a bit complicated at first. So in this case, we want the buttons to be next to each other. So we're just going to do a horizontal stack. Horizontal stack so that all the buttons are encased in it. And this should go away in just a second. And just for further organization, we're going to give it, oh, I'm going to look at that, fills in for me. Alignment, let's give it, let's give it a center alignment. Spacing, five, and the last content I don't quite need. So right here, hopefully, we finish implementing the rating view. Let's give that a preview. All right, so it appears that we have stars. Okay, let's see. Let's test this with a, a zero here. Oh, it's zero now. Let's test it with a two. Let's test it with a five. All right, beautiful. So we have a view working. Now, it does appear that these images are a bit small, so we're going to tweak the image a bit. The first thing we're going to do is we need to make it resizable, like this, and then we're going, that's quite big. Now there is one way we can counter this, is if we just go ahead and tell it to scale to fit. What it's going to do is that it's going to make it bigger while retaining its original aspect ratio. So it doesn't become disproportionate. But this star is still kind of too big. So what I'm going to do now is I'm simply going to specify its frame size. Now because it's scale to fit, I can actually just give it a single value and I'll scale it to that. 50. Oh, there we go. We have a pretty nice looking star here but let's just go ahead and see what 45 looks like okay that looks pretty decent too so now we're going to copy of this to every single one of the star images and the result will be that all the stars will be nice and big so right here, we've got the star view. We got the star view. It's responding to the values. And um, 
Let's go ahead and tie this view right back to our original view. So we know that it's accepting a binding for the rating for the stars to know. Now, in order to do this, it's actually quite simple. Well, we're going to get rid of this text here because this is just for testing. I'm going to place it below the button here. And to call this, we quite literally, and also notice that this file, nowhere does this file say that it, it is somehow related to supporting views. They are simply in the same project. But, see this is one here, it's called, it's called, see this one here is called rating stars. If I just go ahead and call rating stars, it's going to recognize it. And in order to call it, we must use the call, function call. And you see we're missing an argument. That is right, we gotta specify rating for stars. And it's accepting rating. No, it's accepting the. And it is accepting the binding of rating. So, oh, look what we have here. We have the stars just showed up in this view. So, we're going to go ahead and test it inside this preview. Preview is now running and hello reset. Hello reset. And let's see, rate of one, rate of two, rate of three, rate of four, rate of five, rate of two, rate of three, and cancel. And that is functional buttons in SwiftUI and views instructs called by other views. So let's go ahead and recap real quick about views instructs. So this is the structure of a view. When creating a new file of the type SwiftUI view, this code is always going to come preloaded. So you, all you have to do is just change the view name. And to test it in pre preview, simply do dot constant value to pass it in a binding for testing. And finally, to call this view from parent view, simply call it like you would call a function and pass in the correct binding from its parent view into its arguments. So it is now the end of the second episode. And in this episode, we learned how data flows through SwiftUI, how to manage data in SwiftUI, such as using bindings and changing it like any other variables, how to use SF symbols for all your symbol needs, and how to use buttons and packing UI elements into their own structures, as well as some other smaller things such as range operators, and tenary operators for one line code. So we've learned quite a few things in today's episode. Once again, all links and resources will be down in the description below. Please stay tuned for the next episode. And please check out the other episodes of the series for more Swift UI tips to come. And as always, thank you for watching.